Well, today is our final lesson in our series on biblical communication. I have learned a great deal as I've studied the material. I believe the Lord has used it to change my heart, help me to communicate more biblically. We're going to do a quick review, and then we're going to jump right into lesson four, family, communicating with family, family dynamics, and what that, to, what that means to us biblically. Before we do that, let's bow our heads and give thanks and ask for the Lord's blessing. Our Heavenly Father, we come in the name of Christ, your Son, to ask that you be with us today, that you guide our hearts, you open us up to what you want us to learn, to grow in, to see in your word and the truth that you give us each day. Help us to discern between the noise and the chatter around us and the truth that you want to communicate through us to each other, to encourage other believers, and to a world that needs truth desperately. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Before I get started, I want to back up to last week's lesson. And I wanted to put an exclamation point on something that we were talking about. We had a lot of great questions, which took bulk of our time, which was excellent to go through that. And the thing I wanted to underscore was the idea of incorporating our Christian testimony, our witness, in our daily life. And I wanted to share an example of a couple of things that have happened to me in the last year or so. And before I tell you, I want to be clear about the fact that I struggle with this as much as anybody. I may come across as somebody who's more confident than most or is comfortable speaking, but I, I really do struggle with sharing my faith. I mean, I'm, I'm like you. I watch these Ray Comfort videos, and I think, okay, I want to, I want to be like that guy. I want to have a formula. I want to be bold enough to just walk up to anybody on the street. And so in doing that, I believe that when we clearly and honestly live out our faith, the overflow of our hearts will be a witness for Christ. And I have a response to somebody who, of course, people at coffee shops, gas stations, grocery stores will say, hey, how are you doing? And I really don't like to let that question go without some response that lets them know I'm, I'm, I have a grateful heart to God, at least. And so I'll say something like, well, by God's good grace, I'm doing better than I deserve. And on the one hand, that might sound flippant, but sometimes it leads to conversations that are at the core of our faith. I remember a lady at, late at night, a lady at a gas station she asked me how I was doing. She didn't mean it. She was very tired. <laughs> she was just going through the motions. And I said that. I said, you know, by God's good grace, I'm doing better than I deserve. And she looked at me funny, and she said, we all deserve a lot. In fact, most of us deserve more than we have. And I just couldn't let that go. And I looked behind me. I noticed there was nobody else waiting in line. So I thought, OK, I'm going to share with her what I believe about that. So I said, young lady, I, I just have to share with you what I believe is when I read my Bible and I study God's word, it tells me that we don't deserve anything good. In fact, we deserve God's wrath. So everything we get in life that's good, every opportunity, every, the air we breathe, the food we eat each day is a gift from God. And she says, well, you know, I appreciate what you're saying, but I don't believe that. I says, she says, I don't believe that's the truth. I says, well, we all look to places to find the truth, and how can you be sure that it's not truth that you want to believe, but truth that is reality? See, I'm looking outside myself to find God's truth in his word, the Bible, because the Bible isn't something I want to believe. It's actually something that challenges me, is me to change my life. And she didn't, it didn't go anywhere, and it was okay, because as we talked about last week, there is the goodness of the message despite the response. 
And as I've done that more and more and had these conversations, I've realized that God is working in people despite us. We might stumble through our testimony, the sharing of our faith. We might do it in a way that's clumsy. We're going to look back on it later and say, oh, I wish I had said this. I should have said it this way. That was the wrong order. And yet God is bigger than that. He will use these things to bring to heart the message that he wants them to have. And it may not be for a year later or 10 years or at the end of their life. We don't know. So that brings us into our lesson today. We're going to talk about being wise Christ followers among our families. And being in a family means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. We talked about in the first lesson our objectives. And we've gone through this every time we've met. <clears throat> the last one, number three, I've changed a little bit. Three says that those of us who are bold with their words would begin to temper or moderate what we say, and those of us who are timid with their words would be encouraged to speak love, speak love often. All of us being guided by the joy of Christ within our hearts. So again, the overflow of our hearts should be the joy that God, being merciful, calling us out of death into life, would be a natural response. So when I say to you, hey, this Saturday, we're going to go out witnessing, it, it causes, including in me, a little bit of trepidation. So, oh, I don't know if I'm ready for that. Who's going? Where are we going? What kind of tracks will we have? And what if I said to you, every day, we're going to go out witnessing. Every day of your life, you're going to witness to the joy that Christ has put in you. And that's the way we should live. So how do we do that in our families? What is a family? <clears throat> is this a family that you think of when you think of the ideal <clears throat> of a family? Does anybody know who this is? Most of us who are over 40, right? <laughs> Or is this a family? These are refugees coming out of a very dark place in Eastern Europe, I don't know exactly where. But I think we oftentimes idealize what a family should look like. And I think we do it in air. Because most of the families, the structure of a family is different for everybody. So in a family, we start usually with singleness, one person, young person, is thinking about their life. They live as a single person, but they often hope for marriage. And then marriage is the, the Lord bringing together two people as one. And then it's normally a result of that as families grow. And then we have our, have our church family. So again, what is a good family and how do we define that? Big biblically, family is complicated. And we have the most frequent opportunities within our complicated, messy families to live out the gospel. Because crucible of family, people know us best. They know our sides, they know our struggles. We know theirs. And when we're not careful with our communication, we can, instead of uplift, encouraging them in the gospel, we can instead wound people, wound people we love the most. So, thinking about our examples of family, thinking about the photos I put up, which one best represents the families in the Bible, the families that God called the patriarchs of our faith, we have many examples in the scriptures of broken, messy families. For example, Moses. Moses is one of our patriarchs, and yet Moses was a hot-headed killer. He murdered a man, Lee. Jacob. Jacob is also one of our patriarchs. He ended up with an additional wife <clears throat> and had a near deadly falling out with his father-in-law. Joseph and his brothers. 
We all know that story well. Not only did Joseph's brothers abuse him, sell him into slavery, leave him for dead, but then if you continue to read through that part of Genesis, they went on to other wickedness. And by the way, sometimes we read these things and we think, wow, that's harsh. I wish that wasn't in there. I wish they had kind of edited that part out to make these men and their families look a little more polished. And I believe that's what we do in our own minds today. We think, okay, who do I see as, as the family I want to model? Is it the family that stumbles out of the minivan in the parking lot a little bit late for church? The husband has that slightly grumbly look on his face. They're trying to compose themselves because at home getting ready, it was a disaster. And then you see these people that get out of the house and they out of the car and their car is a little bit nicer. Uh, the two-parent household with two kids, boy and a girl, and they're dressed to the nines, they look perfect, and the one family looks to the other and think, okay, I want to be like them. And yet, God's Word points us to families that were broken, that were messy. David, a man after God's own heart. And what about David? <clears throat> he was rash, he was an impulsive man, he was an adulterer, he was a murderer. He was hated by his son. Eli had two sons that ministered in the tabernacle, and yet they defiled the sacrifices and were otherwise very wicked, and the Lord had them killed. So what do we learn from this? We learn that when we're broken, when we're messy, when we don't have our act together, God is ready to redeem us and to use us. How about the woman at the well? The woman at the well walked away from Jesus and went back to the town. Matt. Great. she have going in her life. She was suffering through a series of broken relationships, and at the time she's speaking to Jesus, she's living in an immoral relationship. And yet she runs to town and she says, wait till you hear about this man I met who told me all about my life. And the man she met did not consider her less than because she was a woman did not consider her less than because she was a foreigner. He spoke the truth of the gospel to her despite all of that. So how do we speak as Christ followers among our own messy families? And all these biblical narratives were reminded that we have a need for a savior. The redeeming gospel of our Lord in our marriages, in our parenting, in our singleness, in our extended families, and even in our church family. And so we often think, all right, I've got these issues in my household. I'm the, for example, if I'm the father, I am the head of household. It's my responsibility to bring these people together, to herd all the cats into one room and fix them, and make sure that when we show up to church, we look more like the cleavers than the refugees. And that's not necessarily true. In fact, what is more true is that we need to think of ourselves individually standing before the Lord, our master, and knowing what is our personal responsibility in these roles. Most of the time you hear people going to biblical counseling, or if you've been to biblical counseling, the first thing that is addressed, if it's done right, in my opinion, is Despite everything that happened around you in this family, what was your role as an individual? What was your responsibility? What could you have done differently? What could I have done differently to better reflect a gospel response to the bitterness, to the unforgiveness, to the anger, uh, to the traditions in a family that may go back generations of, of really bad stuff? And so in thinking about my responsibility to this, I'd like us to turn to Matthew chapter 11. 
We're just going to read a few verses at the end of that chapter. Matthew 11, starting in verse 28. How's that? Can you hear me? How's that? I'm not used to this one. Okay, is that a good spot for me? Matthew 11:28, 28, 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So the Lord says, come to me, and the answer is to come to Christ, to find what we need personally in the Lord Jesus Christ and not point the finger and not even consider what others are doing to mess up your life. And he says, all who labor and are heavy laden. Now, labor comes in different forms. Some types of labor is literally working very hard, the sweat of your brow. Other types of labor can be a mom at home with three kids and a new baby and the baby didn't sleep last night. And yet, when the husband goes to work, she's gotta do what she's gotta do. She doesn't get excused from her chores, from her obligations, and maybe on top of that, she's feeling depressed that week. Maybe a parent is very ill or has cancer. And, and as you can imagine, these things compound on top of each other. So in those moments, and, and we've all been there on some level, our source of refuge, our source of strength, is Christ himself. He will give us rest. We have problems, our soul is weary, and the only place for true rest is Christ. And then he says, take my yoke upon you. Now what is a yoke? A yoke is something that an ox would be saddled with. It was usually made out of wood, and that yoke would be burdensome. And it was used to plow fields. They would attach implements to the rear of the yoke. And so what he's saying is, this yoke is truly a burden. I mean, you know it's a burden. You have these obligations. You have these duties. You have this weight in your life that come in different forms. And yet, he's going to say, take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I will make it bearable. So, we rest in him. It doesn't mean we stop working when we rest. We continue working. And sometimes the work is more difficult because once we've decided to follow Christ, we're going to have challenges in our life that, from the world's point of view, add to the burden of day-to-day -day life within a family add to the turmoil. But we have a savior who lightens that burden and at the same time shows the world around us that we have something different that we live by. That we have a source of supernatural strength that we can bear up under this. Does it happen all at once? No. Sometimes it happens over a lifetime. And yet, Christ is writing his testimony on our lives. So we follow Jesus, we focus on our Savior, and we retain the idea that we are personally responsible to follow him. So when each individual within, let's just say, a household of four kids, two adults, maybe a mother-in-law that lives downstairs, and all of these people have their own set of difficulties and challenges, and historical idiosyncrasies that bug the other one. And yet each one, if they are accountable to Christ, if they're seeking Christ personally, come together in a beautiful dynamic of family where the Lord is glorified. 
And when we think about the character of Jesus, the way, by the way, as a single man, he visited and interacted with so many different people. He did it lightly. He did it confidently. He did it lovingly. And he reached down to people that others wouldn't dare to condescend to. Prostitutes, taxpayers, uh, and others, even the Roman soldiers that the Israelites would not want to um, entertain or be a part of their life. So, as we think about these things, and we go through, <clears throat> excuse me, our lives and, and family that makes up different dynamics for everybody, the key idea is to trust Jesus, to speak as wise Christ followers among our own messy families. And by the way, I just need to say this clearly, if you're not part of a messy family, if you're, you know, if you have young children and your parents' marriages are intact and they raised you in a godly home and your kids are well behaved and everything seems to be going well for you, and this sounds strange to you to think about the messy families that we're talking about. Just wait. <laughs> Your kids are going to grow up. And the Lord has both a, the, the Lord has a purpose to redeem your family, and the Lord also has a sense of humor when we become prideful and think that we're going to escape all this messiness. So we trust Jesus, we speak as Christ followers, and we have opportunities within our families that are unique because they know us best. Even though there's hurt, confusion, bitterness, anger, discontentment. So this passage helps us to fix our eyes on Jesus, learn from him, stand up for what's right, and confront our own shortcomings. Let's talk about some of the different family situations we find ourselves in and what those mean. Singleness. Well, as a young person, we all start out, as I said before, as single people. And I was working on this with Forrest as we sat down and talked about marriage versus singleness. And, and he said to me, you know, biblically, in Genesis, marriage is the normal state. I says, yeah, that's true. I said, does that make the single people oddballs? <laughs> and uh, we talked through that. But the Lord did say in Genesis, it's not good that a man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. In Genesis 2.18. And in that, most will be married. Most will eventually, most of these young people in our congregation will have husbands or wives and start families. And so that's where our starting point is. So what about singleness? What does Paul say? Paul says, wherever you're called, wherever you're called, be content and find a way to serve. It's so tempting for us to say, well, I'm a new Christian. I've been going to this church for a year or so. And boy, if I was married, I just, um, just imagine the things we could do together as husband and wife. But that's not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying, wherever you find yourself, you can serve. I think about our missionary, Davis Prickett. Uh, I think about how difficult where he lives, as he's described his living conditions to us, would be if he had a wife and a family and was working there. And it's beautiful to see at this time in his life, what the Lord is doing and what he's capable of. The state of being single in this world can provide us ample opportunities to serve. Every single person, whether they're 18 or 38, just about every one of them, or every one of you who are single, has siblings. You, you might be an aunt or an uncle to somebody. In fact, you might be the sister or the husband of that mom that I described earlier that's having a really tough day. And for those people to come alongside and to be able to be a helper is a beautiful thing. And it's a way that you can uniquely love 
that family. And it's important to reflect on the fact that our Lord himself, while he was on earth, was a single man. And in his ministry, he, he was able to relate to every family dynamic in his singleness. Marriage. Okay, marriage and family. So we get married, we're connected with this person that we're called to love, to serve, to be one with. And we have the, I think we have, as we carry into this marriage, the Cleaver, Cleaver family ideal. And when that ideal doesn't materialize, I think two things happen. The first thing that happens is, this is not what I expected. This person is selfish. I'm a little bit selfish. They're a lot selfish. We're, we're supposed to be doing these things. I don't feel like I'm in love with them. I don't feel, you know, the warm goosebumps I used to feel. Yeah, we better get to church and, and polish this up and make it look like we're living this life that we're called to. <clears throat> and I think early in our marriages, we're hypocrites. We just, we put it on and we act like we're in love. We act like we're gonna do the things we're supposed to do when it may not be coming from the heart. <laughs> And I know in my own marriage, I can say that I have a wonderful gift called a wife, and I'm very, very grateful for that. And, if, and when my kids, my young kids say, hey, Dad, how did this go for you in the first few years? Well, I, I don't like to think about it, but my wife recalls every detail. <laughs> and, and I think that's healthy for adult children to know, oh, wow, I see the redemptive quality of their marriage because at least mom tells us how terrible it was at times and and here I see them in love and it's a testimony to Christ sanctifying and redeeming these two people who are selfish and self-centered and had to struggle through those things to truly love each other and and that should be our goal you know, what, what is God doing in our lives what is the story he's writing on our hearts It's important to know that marriages are models of Christ and his church, models of sacrificial love and commitment, models of beautiful intimacy. And when I say that, remember that the world is watching and we are his living testament. These foundational ideas must be top of our minds while we communicate daily within our households. And if we don't communicate the joy, the love, and the grace of the gospel within our households, and then we go to church and we act differently, or we go out to the world that we don't know well, and we cover that up, we're not being true. We don't have true hearts. And the communication that we attempt to make to that fact will be broken will be interrupted. And as we fail in that, there is repentance. There is forgiveness. There is long suffering that the Lord enables us to work through these things. And those are beautiful things that the Lord not only teaches us, but shows us to model. Parenting. So once you get the marriage thing worked out and you're kind of on the course to having these times of being in love and knowing that there is hope, that we can be together, we can love each other, we can be gracious towards each other, and there is some romance, there are the ideals coming to the surface that we longed for, and then this tiny creature arrives called a baby. The needy, messy, ungrateful, loud, boisterous, selfish creature comes into your house and ruins everything <laughs> for a time. And yet, as we know, especially for grandparents, and we see it from a distance, they're also cute, 
funny, entertaining, thoughtful, clever, endearing, and the raising of them is deeply satisfying in the long term. <laughs> I know that we've had four kids, and when you have four kids that are under the age of 10, it seems like your whole world is consumed with kids and family and all that that entails. And yet, personally, going through that, having the last child, probably when Sophia was 13 or 14, and they're, you know, they're all able to feed themselves, dress themselves, brush their own teeth, you, you, you begin to reflect on, boy, having four more wouldn't have been that terrible. <laughs> and yet in the, you get consumed with, I'm looking at the K family in the back and having shared a meal with them at their house and what a joy it is to visit and see all their kids. And, and I remember that time in my life. But, but we do tend to get caught up in the momentary frustrations and aggravations and weariness. And so as we go through this, if we focus on what is terrible in the moment, the colicky baby, the kids that won't stop fighting, and we don't have a long view of what God is doing in our hearts and in our families, we will not find the joy in our family. Within the kingdom of God, we see ourselves in these children. Jesus reinforces this concept and he says, unless you become like these. He said, in calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom. And so what does that mean? It means we are to be dependent on the Lord above all. That in our time of aggravation, in our time of conflict within our families, we need to know we can go to Christ alone to get reinforced, to get forgiven, to be set on the course, to go back into our families, to love, to serve, and to show grace to them. What about our extended families? Yes, Dave. So, so I am conflicted, as you are, about the social media presentation of our families in the best light possible. And yet, it reminds me that we as humans, even before we're saved, have a sense of what is broken. In other words, we know what is best. We have an inner sense of when there's divorce, when there's... Uh, kids who are left for adoption, when there is aggravation in marriage, we all know it's not what God intended. We have an inner sense of that. And so I think what you're describing is a common denominator, people having a hopefulness of, hey, this is what we aspire to. And, and that's a noble goal. Uh, but, but I have had the, the idea that we should reflect a little more maybe my wife and I should be fighting sometimes as we post on Facebook. I don't know. What I was saying more was that we should find that joy hourly, daily. Meaning what we represent yes. on social media yeah. should and be a constant. Being a certain way, we need to focus on the yes. joy that that attribute of that child is going to shine someday. Amen. We don't live it continually, and, and we should have the hope that we can. I agree. 
and our extended family. So when we got married, my wife and I, we were connected to her parents, my parents, siblings. And when you're a young family, you're a little bit lost on how to navigate the world as you establish your own family. I think it's very important that we follow what we're told in Genesis to leave this family and cleave to this new family. And the reason I say that is because many of the troubles we find ourselves in as new parents or young families are related to the entanglements, the, the, the lack of clarity in how we disconnect from one and adopt and establish the new family. And that doesn't mean that you disconnect entirely. It simply means that it's important for this new couple to say to these other people, hey, we love you, we care about you, we want to be part of your life, and yet God has called us to establish our own family, and these are the things that we believe are true where the, where the Lord is calling us. And you'll probably get pushback on that if you're a young newlywed. And we did, you know, my wife and I did. And yet, and there was a, a few bumps in the road, but over time, it has made a world of difference, especially if you're the older folks, the extended family are not believers, and you're establishing a Christian home for your children as a heritage against the backdrop of what is not Christian heritage. That's so important. And then we have the other categories, aging parents, uncles, cousins, aunts, people who come from mixed marriages within that dynamic, stepfathers, stepmothers, all of that. And yet we find ourselves around the table at Thanksgiving doing the best we can <laughs> to get along and to do what Dave described. Let's act out that very happy extended family that we see in Hallmark cards. Um, grandmother is serving the turkey at the table and everyone is present and the grandchildren are seated at their own little table and, and everybody's getting along great. But we know there's an undercurrent to that usually. And, and it's the mess and it's the the habits, the traditions, the dark sides that we all know are there. And yet, and after Dave's comment, I think about this even more, it is important to think the best, to hope the best for all of these people, even the people that we know are not redeemed and act like it, to hope the best for them too, and to speak into their lives and communicate Biblical grace and joy often in those circumstances which are unique. In fact, you know, Uncle Henry, I don't know if anybody has an Uncle Henry in here. Let's say Uncle Henry, Henry is a drunkard and he usually says things that are out of place at those dinner parties. And yet, we need to see Uncle Henry as somebody who can be redeemed. Somebody that the Lord is going to use us, and maybe just us. Maybe we're the only Christian the voice of Jesus, the instrument of Christ, who will speak into that person's life. We need to be open to that. There are many, many varieties of how this idea of family works out. And sometimes we long for something more than what we have. And we come from a place where there was abuse. There was great disappointment. Um, even thinking about holidays and family get-togethers, thinking about those images in the Hallmark cards brings pain to us, brings a brokenness. And I really believe that's where the church, when it functions at its best, Jesus calling his disciples to come together, his church family, that he cares for, that he loves dearly, is a beautiful thing to consider as, as our resource, as in some ways not even our second family, but our first family, our primary family. 
In Mark chapter 3, verses 31 to 35, it says, And his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him and said, A crowd, sorry, and a crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking about at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God, he is my brother and sister and mother. So what Jesus is saying there is, who are the true family of me? Who are my family members? Those who follow me, those who love me, those who are part of my eternal family. And I think that's important because we need to know that our church family is a refuge for those who have messy, broken families or the memory, the history of what we've experienced as family to go to, a refuge where we can find Christ restoring us to what could have been, to what should be. Church is a beautiful resource for those who find themselves alienated from the traditional idea of family life. Becoming a member of a church should cause us to have sober reflection on what that means because we're committing ourselves to a family of believers that we will spend eternity with. And I think, Christian, that is something we should think about more soberly, including me. We are not simply consumers trying out a church here, see if this church has better music. I like the more traditional, I like the more upbeat worship. In some ways, a church family is like a marriage. You commit to the times where in a marriage, it's tough. You don't feel like it. It doesn't feel good to go. There have been times for us in our church in the past year and a half, I didn't want to come to church. I didn't want to hear what was happening. It was very difficult. But I was committed to the idea that this is my family. This is the family of God. And these are the people that I should love and cherish and pour into when everything else falls apart. I really believe that's what the early church who was heavily persecuted had going for it. They were so dependent on each other. They had no choice once they committed but to find everything they needed within that body. So what does it say in Ephesians? Let's read this together. I don't know if you can see it up there. In chapter 1, verse 3 to 14, it describes what it means to be brought into this family. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time, to unite all things in him, things in heaven, things on earth. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we, who were the first to hope in Christ, might be to the praise of his glory. 
In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. So I have a question for all of us. If we believe this about ourselves, do we live like it? Is it reflected in the way we live, in the way we talk to each other, in the way we communicate with our spouse, with our children? Because if this is true about us, we should be overjoyed and that joy should reflect in everything we do. God has called us to love our brothers and sisters deeply. These relationships are eternal. This is our spiritual family. This is the family in which God wants to restore brokenness. We're great. We're doing great on time, by the way. <laughs> are there any questions up to now? We have time for questions. Sophia? Good question. And, and this is one example of a scenario that someone might find themselves when they're called into the family of faith. So single parent, let's just say they have a few kids and the husband is either died or there's divorce or desertion, even worse. All the more important for, for Christians that are part of a church family or Christians who are part of an extended family. Maybe this is uh, your sister in the future might be a single mom. You, have, you want to be prepared. We want to prepare our hearts to be able to love and to serve and to pour grace into that person's life because when the Lord promises the things he does in his word about protecting the orphans and loving the widows, he does it through the instruments of his people. And his people and again, I'm speaking to myself as well. His people are called to be prepared to serve and to love and to be ready to open their homes and their hearts to people like this. We get very, very comfortable, especially in this country, in, in setting up the lifestyle and the, and the comforts we enjoy and the, the expectations we enjoy. And yet, I find myself as I get older being called in my prayer life to be ready to be uncomfortable and interrupted in any moment for the sake of the gospel. And, and I think that helps, Sophia, to know if God's people are ready to embrace somebody who is hurting, who is deserted, who has children, that is going to glorify the Lord in, in a way that his word promises. Remember. In the Old Testament, he's calling these patriarchs out of bad situations, messy situations. And even as they clumsily walk through their lives of faith, uh, it's, it's still broken and messy. And God's purposes, God's promises, and God's glory is the focus that we should have. And we are a part of that, which is a beautiful thing. Does that answer your question? Any others? Can I just fill yes. in on that a little bit? Having been in that situation myself as a single parent at church, um, it has to go beyond Sunday morning. Um, a lot of times I felt very alone because 
I didn't have a lot of friends at that time in my life and had two small kids and mm -hmm. and so you know everybody was great to me uh, it was at a different church but everybody was great to me on Sunday morning but then you know there was no inclusion after that so I think we have to really um, kind of actively seek out uh, people that are in that situation and you know care for them outside of just Service. Yes, so I'm going to rephrase that so it's on record. When we have people in the situation that we just described, single parent and many other circumstances, it is easy on Sunday morning to surround that person to encourage them with, with great words and testimony and, and verses. But we need to put it into action throughout the week and we need to be not only aware of the need, but we need to be seeking those in need. And I think that's in some ways as difficult as witnessing for Christ to strangers, because what we're doing is we're breaking through the barriers. That single mom does not want to say, oh, I need a lot of help. I need everything you can imagine. I am at my wit's end. Because we all have our dignity. We all have a certain amount of pride that is a, a barricade against just receiving the good things. And we as God's people need to be as winsome as Jesus himself. We need to break through that and say, I understand what you're going through. And maybe you're a person that has been through that. And God has equipped you specifically, having experienced it, to reach into that person's life, to break through those barriers. And we're called to that. Uh, I, I don't know if you've all heard of the 80-20 principle. Um, the way I see the 80-20 principle work out in the church is 20% of the people or less support 80% of the programs and what's happening and the ministering. And I think we should reverse that and make it 80% of us are doing the heavy lifting. What a beautiful and glorious thing that would be. Somebody had their hand up over here. Al? I just want to make a, uh, maybe a little change of focus here. Um, let's not forget that it's God that's doing all this. And uh, we just need to be available to God. The, the, the uh, <clears throat> trepidation that we have sometimes in, in communicating the gospel to other people <clears throat> might be more us doing the work Mm -hmm. rather than God doing the work. Because when we were, when you read earlier <clears throat> that the uh, yoke that Christ puts on us is, in, in, in my Bible it says, light. It's a light and even a purposeful and even a, a pleasant yoke. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> um, sometimes when we uh, I think we can be purposeful in when we are going to give the gospel out to someone. At least we should be purposeful in <clears throat> trying to make the opportunity for that to happen. And there are many ways you can do that. And then you talk about uh, maybe um, uh, meeting people at the, at the line, at the, gro the grocery store, or whatever. And. Uh, if, if you think that you are the one that's going to be doing the gospel, giving the gospel, you might be a little off on that because it's really God that is creating the opportunity for you to be there so that you can give the gospel. And that may not be the best place to give the gospel, but it's an opportunity that you have of expressing your faith anyway. And you do have to have some re reciprocation from the person to give you feedback as to whether they are accepting or rejecting what you're saying. I mean, nine times out of ten, they may be rejecting it. But then you'll, you may have the, that, uh, that soul that is hurting there, that whatever you said, you may not even understand what you said, but it might have been a com comfort to that person. Yeah. So I think if we shift the focus a little bit on so much us not doing the work, but God doing the work through us, 
it's a lot, a lot better. Uh, it's a lot more comforting when you think about the uh, um, the the work that the Holy Spirit is doing in our lives. <clears throat> what does it say? The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, joy, peace yes. long suffering, <coughs> gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, temperance. All of these things are available to us through the Holy Spirit. The unbeliever does not have that. They don't have the true comfort that they can give to others. They have, you know, a lot of things they can do, but the believer has the true comfort. The believer is the one that can comfort other people. And so if we think in terms of what God is doing and expressing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, then we are letting God work through it. And a lot of times we don't do that. We, we let the, the flesh take over. Sure. You know, so um, having the Spirit work in, in our lives, it, it's not a burdensome thing. You know, a lot of times it's just delightful. When, when you have a chance or you've made, a, made an opportunity or God has given you the opportunity to speak to someone about the gospel, it's a wonderful opportunity. And, you know, having you pray for that person and things like that are um, just fruit of the Spirit. Uh, yeah, I want to just amen to everything you said. If I could just add one caveat that I think is helpful. Based on what you said, Al, it's all the more important that we don't wait till we have the perfect script or formula that God can use our, our young, early Christian, you know, we, we have little theology. When we speak clumsily and when we speak regularly about the joy we have in Christ, the Lord is bigger than us in all of that, and he will work it out. I mean, he's doing the work, as Al said. And I remember my, dad, my own father living out the gospel. We worked together. He was a staunch Catholic. He was not a believer. And he was critical of my faith. And I didn't know a lot. I would read my Bible at lunchtime at work, and I would pray. And that's about all he saw. But he... It was an irritation to him to know that I was leaving the family faith, the family sect, if you will. And yet, one day, when he and my mother separated, he came to me in tears and he said, you didn't say much about your faith, but you lived it and I saw it and I want it. That was the Lord. The Lord was doing that. And I was, and in some ways, I was a bystander watching the Lord work. Yes, Jeff. Uh, the other thing we have to remember is that uh, we are ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador, uh, in human terms, takes the message of his superiors, say to another nation, presents it. If there is rejection there, it's not against the ambassador. It's against who he represents, represents yeah. and that's the same with us. If we get rejection in our testimony, they're not re rejecting mm -hmm. us. They're rejecting the truth that we're carrying from an almighty God. You're right, it is an obstacle that we take it personally and that we wear it personally because it's not about us, it's about Christ. And once he, and it could be next week, it could be a year, 10 years from now, when he breaks through that veil, those same people will reflect lovingly on what we did for them. <clears throat> Let me wrap this up because we're over time. <clears throat> I want to conclude this entire series by saying God converts our hearts. He makes us into godly communicators. We need to trust what God is doing in the long term. And it is God's work. We are part of his story, not the other way around, and yet he loves us dearly, and he wants us to be part of this story. The more we have a long view of God's redeeming restoration, and we trust to, that God will restore all that he sees broken, the more at peace we will be with God's plan and God's timing. The hope and the power of the gospel combined with an eternal 
perspective is what should propel us from apathy to enthusiastic joy. And when we do that, it will be contagious. When we communicate with our spouses, with our children, with our neighbors, with the world around us, our joy in Christ will overflow and be obvious. Let us then go out today and begin to live and speak to that which we hold claim to, being children of the king of the universe and heirs to every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you once again. We thank you for these truths. We thank you for continual grace, despite where we've been, despite our hard hearts, even this morning. You are a God who restores. You are a God who calls us to adoption. We have the promises of eternity to live and reign with you, to be loved by you as little children. Let us take comfort in that. Let us be greatly encouraged and let that love and joy overflow in everything we say and do. And we look forward to seeing the work that you accomplish through us. In Christ's name, amen.